Welcome everyone to the first and only presentation about conversion rate optimization at JM Beyond 2012. Feel free to give me any feedback on this presentation, or if you would like to discuss some concepts, hit me on after the presentation, or reach me on Twitter. The Twitters are up on the sheet. You might be wondering, why is this the second sheet about a Tupperware party at a JM Beyond conference? Tupperware parties are an old marketing concept, which are still used today as well. They are small-scale sales events hosted at residential homes, and they are trying to sell plastic containers to housewives. There's also a modern version of the Tupperware party, also known as the vibrator party. <laughs> Similar concept, just a different shape of plastic. Both of these parties are uh, highly popular and they are extremely successful at selling what they're trying to sell. At the end of this presentation, I will discuss the concepts that are used and explain why these parties are so successful. I will give you a couple of examples of how we are manipulated daily using psychological tactics. The more you know about these tactics, the more you will see them in real life. For example, I think this is a really great discount. Well, I'm sure this one is in fact an error, and that's why somebody made a picture of it. These type of discounts happen on a daily basis. Usually, when a company decides to go on a big sale, they artificially raise these before prices, hoping to create a larger uh, gap between the before and the after price, and they actually sell the item at the regular price. But you think, whoa, discount, nice, I have to buy it now. Another example are uh, intentional cues at clubs. Often when you go to a popular club in a big city, there's a queue in front of it. And once you get in, the club's not full. <laughs> they are creating these cues, hoping to uh, provide social proof for that club. After all, there is a queue for the club, so the club must be popular. If they would let all those people in that want to go into the club, there wouldn't be a queue anymore. Therefore, the club wouldn't be popular anymore. It's a self-fulfilling concept. If you keep the queue intact, it will be perceived as a popular club and more people will come in. How many days is a few? How does this even trigger people to buy these things? I don't even know, not sure what's on sale. At this store. The thing is, by stating that there's only a few days left, people will think, whoa, if I don't buy these items now, I might never have the chance to buy them again. Let's buy them now. During presentations such as the one I'm giving now, there's often discussion on how ethical it is to use psychological tactics to improve your business, or any life goal for that matter. My stand on it is that you have to use the knowledge as power. If you know how to use it, you can use it for both good and evil, and it's up to you to decide whether you want to use it or not. I will discuss several influence tactics later, but I will first start with a short introduction on what conversion rate optimization actually is. More plastic. Most people uh, think their website is like a bucket. Visitors will land in, they will look around in the bucket, find their optimal item they want to buy, buy, and leave the bucket again. If only that were true. This is actually more like your website. People will fall in. Most of them will fall through the cracks. A few of them will keep in the colander. And uh, those are the people that will buy from your website. Rather than staying in the bucket, they will fall through. Imagine this is your website. It has 100 visitors each day. Not that many, but if I had put on more on the sheet, it wouldn't have looked as great as this one. Only two of these people convert. A conversion can be defined in several ways, such as uh, the buying of an item, signing up for your newsletter, uh, contacting you, or uh, giving you a lead that could uh, potentially lead to a new uh, client that you want to visit. This 2% of people converting at your website is actually the global average e-commerce rate. Those two red dudes over there are your only customers. The other black ones are not buying from you. That's an enormous potential of people that 
could buy from your website if only you gave them the chance and you provided them with the uh, proper uh, motivation to do so. Why is this all relevant, you might wonder. Well, I can give you 300 million reasons why conversion rate optimization might be relevant. As discussed by uh, Luke W. in his book uh, Web Form Design, he described one conversion rate optimization fix that gained that company he did it for $300 million in revenue over the next year. The fix he did was to remove the button that says register during checkout. He just implemented a register as guest option and it netted the company over $300 million. Such a small change, so, many, so much money. This is the guy we'll be talking about today. He is called Robert Cialdini, and he's a professor of psychology at the Arizona State University. He is uh, perceived as the leading expert on the subject of influence, and he wrote an excellent book about it. The book is called Psychology of Persuasion, Influence. What Robert did was go undercover for over three years to write about this book. He went undercover as a waiter, as a second-hand car salesman, and he even went undercover to learn more about aliens. This book sold over two million copies and is translated into 26 languages, which, in my opinion, makes it a classic. What we'll be doing next is discuss the six tactics that Robert Cialdini has described in his book, of which you can read about the first on this sheet. What's happening on the sheet, which you have all read, so I don't have to explain the actual events, is that the guy on the left is offering a service to the guy on the right, and once he has complied, the guy on the left is asking for a favor back, which he gets. This is the concept of recipro reciprocity. I give, so I get. To explain how this concept works and why it is such a strong concept in our mind, we have to go back to prehistoric times. If a tiger was attacking our village, if a tiger was attacking our village, we would be all at jeopardy. One single man would harm his own uh, life to protect the village from the tiger. What if other people could join in and we could fight the tiger together? Then again, by helping, I would risk my own life against that tiger. If only I knew that if I helped fight the tiger, you would offer me a better cave to sleep at night. I give, I get back. By implementing a system of giving and getting, people would have a sort of psychological debt with other people that would allow them to give without immediately getting something back. This concept still works in modern times as well. In fact, a gift as small as a paperclip is uh, providing enough motivation for people to comply with any request more than people who weren't giving that same small, worthless paperclip. How is that used in real life? Um, the mints that are often laying on checks when you uh, pay at a restaurant are known to significantly increase the tips you give at a restaurant. Also, have you noticed how the people uh, that you pay your money during the checkout at a restaurant often ask you, did you enjoy your food? They want to stimulate you more to, to, see, you, uh, to see the event at the restaurant as a positive experience. They are giving back kindness, mm -hmm. hoping that you might tip more because you would think, oh, yeah, it was in fact a great meal. How can we use this on our own websites to increase our conversion rate? For example, you could give away free samples of your product, a free demo, a free version perhaps, a free ebook, free website analysis, free advice. Each and every one of you will have something to offer for free, whether it's small or big, that could lead people to think, hey, I've been giving something nice. What if I gave something back? Remember the example of the paperclip? There doesn't need to be an uh, equality in the 
monetary or psychological value that is given compared to what is given back by the other party. The second principle, I shall be consistent. The guy on the left is now stuck with this gigantic banner of a guy beating another guy, which is actually a pictogram in a set of pictograms. I'm not sure what that's used for in normal circumstances, but it was really great for this presentation. Why is it that we want to be consistent with what we have committed to before? It is because society values consistency and commitment as a value trait. We like people who are consistent because we know we can rely on what they say. People who are inconsistent often promise you things and don't do it afterwards. If that happens too often, our minds get confused. It takes a lot of processing time to think about, hey, he promises me, will he actually deliver? And therefore, we love people who are consistent, who do what they say and move in a fairly straight line towards their goals. An example of how this commitment and consistency is uh, applied in the real world is this Furby. This innocent uh, plush animal was a popular child toy about five years ago. What stores apparently do around Christmas is undersupply their most popular toy. Parents promise their children around the holidays that they will give them that Furby. Once they actually reach the stores, at December 24th probably, the item is out of stock, so they can't buy that promised Furby. To not disappoint the child, they buy the second best item. They give it to their child. Two weeks later, the child comes crying, I want my Furby. Okay, I'll get you your Furby. What has happened? The store has sold twice the items it would have sold compared to when it had the first uh, Furby on stock the first time the parents came there. The stores are playing in on the commitment and consistency of those parents in order to sell twice the amount of items. Apparently, this is happening year after year. Can you repeat it, please? I didn't understand very well. <laughs> Not because... Uh, no, it's good. Um, what stores are doing is undersupplying the amount of the most popular toy so that the parents promise that item to their children and the children get disappointed because the item was out of stock. They buy a second-rate item, and two weeks later, they have to buy the Furby after all, because the parents have promised it before to their children. How can we apply this to our own websites? The Tweet to Win is a really great example of this. Uh, research has shown that written uh, commitments are one of the strongest form to trigger this effect that I just described. So if somebody is uh, incentivized to tweet about your company, for example, that chair company is the best I was ever at. Those people are mentally committed to that chair company now. So for only a price of perhaps one free chair, they will have both advised other people to go to your website and be committed to the product themselves. Another example. What if you could get visitors to fill in the tiniest form on your website about your products? For example, give them a product chooser. They could uh, fill in, I want to buy, uh, I love blue products. That scale. What if after hitting the submit button, you could supply them with an actual blue widget that scales? These people have indicated seconds before that they would love to have a blue widget that scales. Commitment and consistency is forcing them gently and to actually consider buying the exact item they just uh, mentioned they wanted to buy. Third principle. Social proof. What many others do is good. Safety comes in numbers? Not always. It depends on what the large number of people are doing. How is this used, or perhaps abused? Have you ever noticed that whenever you uh, see a tip jar laying around somewhere, it's always filled? 
Whether you come at the start of the evening or the very end of the evening, there's always a decent amount of money in a tip jar. How did it get there? It was put there by the patrons to make you believe that other people had already tipped a large amount of money in the bar. Why would I be the person that doesn't give a decent amount of tip? After all, all the other people did it as well, right? Not exactly. Street performers use the same trick when they lay out their guitar cases in front of them. There's always money in them, no matter when they uh, start their act. If you pay close attention when a street performer is starting his act, you can actually see him throw some money in the case himself to stimulate other people to show uh, the same behavior. This was the alien example I was referring to before. Um, what Robert Cialdini and his colleagues did was infiltrate into a cult that was uh, set on the fact that the aliens were landing and apocalypse would come. Being fairly certain that they were wrong, they decided to uh, use this as a psychological, uh, a psychological experiment to see how the people would react after the aliens didn't come. What would happen? Well, in fact, the aliens didn't come. Surprise, surprise. Strangely enough, the people got more attached to the cult after that. How can that possibly happen after the, the gigantic thing they were predicting did not come true? They needed more social proof. Because there was no physical proof anymore of what they had believed in for years and months before, they needed other, uh, other proof to say to themselves, what I have been doing for the past few months wasn't worthless. With the lack of physical proof, they switched to social proof. Because after all, what many people are thinking um, influences what a single person thinks about that. I'll repeat that. The more people that find an ID correct, the greater the chance that an individual who thinks about that ID will think the same about that problem. So all these people who are looking uh, to the right, most of them, if I were to think about this picture and decide what side was best, I would be swayed to the right because all these people have their visuals to the right. The same effect was used here. They needed more social proof to actually show to themselves, okay, the direction we were looking at was right, despite the facts that the aliens didn't come and apocalypse didn't happen. But that's a minor detail. How can we use this? The effect of social proof is strongest for people who are closest to us. If somebody uh, were to tell me about a great way to, uh, about a great fitness club, if that person was 60 and from an entirely different country, I wouldn't attach too much value to his opinion because he is so different from me. On the other hand, if that person was the same age as me, perhaps doing the same things I do, on a daily basis, just as swaying flies from my head, I would be very much more triggered to believe what he said is right. What if you could manage to get testimonials on your website that originated from the same country as your visitor? How great would it be to see um, Koen Kuipers from the Netherlands giving a testimonial about my products when I come as a Dutch person uh, to that website reading, the service is great, I'm so happy with this company. If that person were from an entirely different country, I would be less uh, similar to that person and therefore less likely to believe what he has to say. Social proof in action. 3,224,525 people like this website. How can I not like it? If all those other people are liking that website, it must be awesome, right? I don't think many people around here will have so many social likes, but I think the effect uh, I'm trying to describe here still works. You can use Facebook for this, Twitter, RSS uh, feed subscribers, Google Plus One, circles you're in. If you can display that many other people like what you're doing, other people are more inclined to believe that what you do is great. The fourth one. This one is rather complicated, so I will explain this one in a slight more detail. The guy on the top left is contemplating to donate $1,000 to uh, good charities. The girl on the left is stating, we're friends. And the guy on the top, bottom right is stating, we've never met. 
couple hours later, he has made up my mind and says, I like my friends. Because the girl on the left has stated that they were, in fact, friends, he decides to donate his money to the girl on the bottom left. Guy on the bottom right gets zero money because, well, he wasn't his friend. The endless chain method is an uh, interesting method used in marketing. What the method does is once, an, once you sell an item to someone, you ask them for references of other people that might also like this product. In fact, the might also like this product uh, feature on many websites applies to the same principle. When people are telling you about, um, when friends, in fact, people similar to you, are telling you, hey, you should look at this product. It's awesome. I bought it as well. In this one sentence, I just used three different psychological tactics I've described before. Once somebody close to you is saying, this is great, your mind somehow shortcuts most of the, um, the objections it usually has when somebody uh, advises you something. It already shortcuts through the, I know who he is, I like him, we're similar. And the chances of actually purchasing the item a friend advises is far greater than if a random person would advise me to purchase an item. Therefore, if you ask or uh, try to get people to, you might also like, to their friends, it will likely increase the chances of those friends actually buying your products. And you don't even have to do anything for it because the other people are doing the work. The best, salesman, best car salesman in the world is in fact selling over five new cars every day for the past many years. One of the strongest tactics he described in the book uh, Influence is that he in fact sends a card that displays no more than I like you, every single month to every single of the customers he once had. Well, this might sound weird. I mean, another one of those I like you cards. It keeps his customers, uh, it keeps him on top of mind of all his customers. So whenever the point reaches that their car breaks down or they want to advise another person to purchase a new car, they'll think, hey, that was the great guy I purchased my car from. Oh, wait, I have this great card that says I like you. I can forward that to one of my friends and they can go to the same car salesman to buy that car. How can we use that on our websites? Rather than sending out postcards, we could send out newsletters. I'm not advising to make them say in a really large font, I like you. I don't think it'll work as well as it did for that car salesman. But the principles still apply. If you can get other people to um, to stay on top of mind for other people, if you send them a newsletter and actually provide value in that newsletter, these people will be, just like with the postcards, constantly reminded of the fact that you're around, that you're great, that you're thinking about them. Well, actually, it's your mailing system thinking about them, but they don't know that. If you stay on top of mind, these people, when they need a product that you're selling, will think, hey, I got that newsletter last month. It had such great value. I'll at least check out the company that sent me that newsletter, and they'll just ignore all your competitors because they weren't on top of mind at that moment. Another way to use the liking effect is beauty. People are attracted to attractive things. If you could manage to associate your good-looking car with that good-looking women, Many men are more inclined to buy that car, even despite the fact that we think it's pretty because that pretty woman is standing next to it. You could actually sell more ugly cars with more pretty women next to it than just sell pretty cars. It's a really strange effect, but we're naturally drawn to attractiveness. If you could somehow associate your products with attractiveness, whether by actually making your product attractive or for example, by displaying a pretty women next to it, people will perceive your product as, as better, as more attractive, as more purchase-worthy, perhaps. The fifth principle, authority.
The Influence book is uh, showcasing one of the most famous uh, experiments in social psychological history. It's called the Milgram experiment. It's actually a slightly complicated experiment, so I will do my best to explain. Please raise hands if I'm not clear. What happens is uh, two persons enter the experiment. One person is assigned the role of experimenter and the other the role of subject. There's in fact uh, another uh, experiment leader and he is leading the experiment for the other two people. The subject is placed into a separate room, closed off, only uh, audible by sound what's happening in that room. The experimenter is given a list of questions which he has to ask to the um, subject. For every time the subject answers a question wrong, the experimenter has to um, turn up the amount of electrical shock that is given to the subject. Well, at first these shocks are relatively mild, only 10 volts. Um, at some point, when the subject keeps answering the questions wrong, the meter is turned up until levels that the subject starts screaming about how he doesn't want to participate anymore, about the pain he's feeling, about many bad things. Even the experimenters at some point start displaying a feeling to go away. They don't want to participate anymore. Then when the experiment leader tells them, no, you have to commit, you have to turn up the meter because you answered that question wrong. Uh, from the top of my head, I think 85% of the people will actually turn up the meter to a point where it says potential death. The authority used in this non-real experiment, because the subject isn't giving any physical shocks, he is just instructed to scream at several points in time, is best showcased by this next sheet. A mental shortcut. People wearing a white coat, when they say things, we should comply. Because after all, they are an authority in what they're doing, and because of the white coat, we have to do what they say even when they tell us to give electrical shocks to people who might die of that effect. The same holds in a lesser degree to people wearing a suit. If you want to get something done from another person, it's best to wear a suit, because the same mental shortcut will kick in. He's wearing a suit, so he must be an authority, so what he does, I must, what he says, I must do. Of course, this is a really weird concept. If I were to ask the same question to a person wearing a suit or wearing this outfit, it wouldn't make the request any different. It would just make the mental shortcut kick in. How can we use this? For example, once again, you could display the amount of followers you have on Twitter. If that amount is large, people will perceive you as an authority in the field. Otherwise, why would all those people be following you if you hadn't had anything interesting to say? You could display your connections. The, the authority people you're connected to actually increase your social status as well. Because after all, if you're connected to those people, you must be important as well. Display any titles or honorary degrees you might have. Display badges that you've earned on other websites saying, uh, he has, has completed this questionnaire and scored a 98%. Awesome. Get other people to reference you. Let uh, authority people say, hey, this company is great. You should buy there too. Display any affiliations with uh, companies that are perceived as successful. By a, an effect known as the halo effect, people will actually start thinking, hey, he is associated with that company that's actually great. Therefore, he will probably be great as well. The sixth and last uh, influence tactic is known as scarcity. A company that's really great at creating scarcity is a company that pretty much supplied a device to each and every one of you in this room. It's Apple. In fact, uh, about two weeks ago, my colleague Robin and I wanted to buy two new iPads. We live in Holland, so 
there's a lot of stores within driving distance. In fact, I think there were over 50 stores that could potentially sell us a new iPad. It took us a Hollandish long drive to actually find one store able to sell us one iPad. So of all the potential 50 stores that could be selling iPads and could uh, profitably do that, because when we called them, they actually stated, I wish we had more because there's many, co uh, many persons already on the waiting list. They were simply not being supplied then by Apple. By creating this scarcity, by making a new iPad actually a rare item, it becomes more attractive to people. The less access we have to something, the more we desire it. In fact, um, during the early 90s, alcohol was forbidden in America. At once, many people started to brew their own alcohol. They decided to supply it to other people. People started drinking more because it was forbidden, because it was rare, because it was difficult to actually get that alcohol. This really weird concept of scarcity was applied by our great friend Brian Thiemann to sell out his pre-event. There's actually three more of those, but that wouldn't have fitted well on a sheet. What Brian has done is create scarcity. Rather than saying on the first tweet, we have 150 pre-events tickets available, please buy them. He created scarcity by in fact only creating 50. I remember uh, when I read that, it was about uh, 11 p.m. and I was going to bed. I clearly thought there's not gonna to be only 50 tickets for that pre-event. Ryan is, Brian is using his scarcity effect to sell out these tickets faster. And it's exactly what happened. When I woke up the next morning, the tickets had already sold out, and I saw Brian's tweet, oh, oh, we managed to get 30 more, awesome. Like he didn't knew that when he posted the 51, that there were going to be far more uh, tickets available. By supplying them in small amounts, he created a scarcity effect so that every time persons were trying to buy tickets, they saw there's only 15 left. People did the math, 250 people, many will likely come to the pre-event, only 15 tickets left. If I don't buy these tickets now, they might sell out and I can't go to the pre-party. And again, all the tickets sold out. Wee! New tickets, once again. He actually managed to pull this off five times. Thing is, after the uh, third or uh, uh, second or third time, People started noticing. Uh, Sander Potcher actually tweeted as a reply to this one, wow, Brian, even more tickets, that's great. Where do you get them? These effects can only be used in, uh, in moderate. You shouldn't overdo them. Clear to me, Brian overdid it on this one. Well, he did in fact sell out his event, so it worked. But he did get called out. People actually noticed the fact that he was trying to game the system. It did work for him, but he actually made it to my presentation, so I'm not sure if it was the best way to sell out this event. How can we use this? By creating limited editions. The glasses behind me were uh, offered by, if I remember correctly, McDonald's, as a limited edition glasses that you could get once you bought a certain uh, set of items at McDonald's. Because they stated so clearly that the edition was limited, people actually started going more to McDonald's in order to get these limited edition glasses. These pieces of glass worth about 50 cents. The fact that they were limited and perhaps never to be uh, acquired after this limited edition period made them so desirable that people wanted to get more of these glasses and in fact tried to collect the entire uh, set of them. Had these items been sold in a random store, for example, at Walmart, those items would probably not have been bought at the value that people were trying to sell them. Just the effect of making them scarce and limited triggered people to go to McDonald's and purchase these items. I promise to tell you more about Tupperware parties. 
or as I have dubbed it on this sheet, influence parties. Tupperware parties, um, there's uh, one Tupperware party starting every 2.7 seconds somewhere around the world. During this presentation, hundreds of Tupperware parties have started somewhere in the world. Why are they doing that and why are these parties so wildly successful? For example, they use the liking concept that we discussed during this presentation. Rather than, um, I think that's her, rather than the actual salesperson selling these Tupperware items to those people, it's one of the friends of these other girls that's selling the items. Everybody knows that she gets a cut of the actual sales made. But how hard is it to not comply when this friend is saying, ah, oh, check this great item, you should buy that. You can actually feel it in your tummy when you're thinking right now, no, I do not want to buy that item from you. Well, if it had been that saleswoman trying to sell the item, it would have been far easier. You could just mentally block it out. Ah, oh, she's just trying to sell stuff. I don't want that. But if a friend is asking you, would you buy that, please? You are far more likely to comply. Second effect that's being used, scarcity. There's only a limited number of each of the uh, Tupperware containers available on such a Tupperware party. If the specific size that's being promoted is sold out, at that specific Tupperware party, you can't buy that specific Tupperware container anymore. What if you want that specific container? Then you have to buy it fast. Scarcity. Only two left. Please buy this one. And once again, specific set is sold out. Let's begin with the next set. And only again, 10 available, just like Brian did. There's a new set. Everybody knows there's going to be a new set, but the effect that only two items are available of that specific container size is triggering once again these people to buy that considerable uh, container size because there's only two left. Social proof. If that woman decides to buy five of those awesome Tupperware containers, what will likely happen to that woman? She will think, hey, that's my friend. She's using the kitchen in exactly the same way I am because we live in the same neighborhood, same socioeconomic status, we have the same income, our partners are connected. She is very likely to buy more Tupperware containers because after all, she made the mental decision to buy it and we will just mental shortcut that one and decide, oh, if she decides to buy it and she is similar to me, I guess I should buy them as well. Another thing that's being used is authority. This woman is being placed in an authoritative position right now. Rather than actually wearing a white lab coat or a suit, the fact that she is standing here, or in fact the fact that I'm, I am standing here, is placing me or her in an authoritative position. By having that position, you can uh, make people comply to what you want them to do. After all, you're being placed there, you're the authority, click, clock, mental shortcut, what authorities say is good, I should do that. Even when they are saying, buy my ridiculously expensive plastic containers. Click, clock, shortcut, authority, purchase. Um, I've right now uh, discussed four of the six effects that are used. Uh, four of the six influence tactics that I discussed that are used on such a Tupperware party. I think there's even far more that I haven't even discussed. But what I did was try to describe you why these Tupperware parties are so wildly successful because they are applying the tactics that um, Robert Cialdini described. Not everybody wants to be influenced by the tactics I explained. But how can we prevent from being influenced by uh, principles that are so deeply ingrained in our brain, in our evolution, in pretty much everything we do? Problem is, uh, with most of these tactics, it is wise to actually uh, roll with them, to do what the psychological effect is triggering on you. Except when it's something you wish you hadn't done afterwards. What you can do is use psychological jujitsu. I did it. Um, in jujitsu, you are using the power of your opponent in attempting to uh, strengthen yourself. If somebody is trying to sell you an item, 
you have to mentally look back and try to reframe what's happening. That person is not trying to sell you uh, because you're his friend or because he actually wants you to have that item. That person is trying to get the largest possible commission of that LCD television that he is advising you. If you can use that and try to get around what that opponent is saying, your opponent in this case, and try to look at what's actually happening, is that TV worth more than the other TV next to it? Or is that salesman just trying to increase his own commission in trying to get more money out of me? Use your belly. As described by Cialdini in his book, he described an example of a um, salesman that was coming at his door. It was an attractive young woman, and she was trying to sell him a uh, magazine and entertainment subscription package. She was asking him questions about how often he went to the cinema, how often he went out for dinner, how much DVDs he watched, how much time um, he spent in the theater. In trying to look attractive and socially outgoing to that women, he increased the numbers. He said, oh, I go to the cinema twice a week and I love to go on expensive dinners. Subconsciously, he was just trying to uh, make the women attracted to him. Not particularly in trying to date her, but just trying to uh, be perceived as socially and physically attractive by doing all those socially outgoing things. The more and more questions the women asked, the more and more he started to feel in his belly that something odd was happening. After about question four or five, she confronted him with the fact that she was offering an awesome entertainment package. She quickly added up all the value that he described, his two cinema visits a week, his free theater visits, his uh, expensive lunch, his um, DVDs he was purchasing. And she mentioned to him that if he took the unlimited entertainment package she was offering, he would pay 25% less. This was the moment he felt in his belly that he was being taken. That attractive woman that approached him and triggered him to be more socially outgoing had in fact trapped him into a situation which he, by several psychological tactics I described, couldn't get out of anymore. If he said, now, no, 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 I, I lied, I didn't go to all these, these events, his commitment and consistency will kick in and say, hey, that's not consistent behavior, you can do that. If you don't do that, people will try to, uh, will see you as an inconsistent person, and that's not socially likable. Once you start to feel in your belly that you're being taken, you should try to step back. Not always your belly is right, but in most of these cases, your belly feeling, or intuition as it's often called, uh, actually uses your subconscious brain, which is vastly more powerful than your conscious brain, and by making that feeling in your belly, it's actually warning you you're being taken. Step back, try to look at what actually is happening, and try to uh, get around the feeling of purchasing that item you don't want. As Tialdini described in his book, he tried to reframe the action well, after it had happened, and he had, of course, purchased the package. He tried to think back, how could I have defeated this attractive woman in what she was doing? The way he preferred most was to actually call it out. After he had answered those questions, being pretty much lured into uh, trying to buy that entertainment package, he, uh, in his imagined version of the story, told her, hey young lady, I can see that you are very attractive, and because you are, I was trying to be more social sociably outgoing and told you these things. I'm very sorry, I did not actually go to all these events, and I was just trying to impress you. Therefore, I will not buy your package, um, and please go out. He was actually very proud of himself for doing that, rather than the fact that he didn't actually do it. But by reframing these actions, and by actually uh, calling out the tactics that were used by the saleswoman, he could mentally get around the commitment and consistency effect that had kicked in. She was cheating the system. She was not using the commitment and consistency as it... Uh, has evolved in our brains. She was using it to uh, make him get that entertainment package. Once he called that out, he equaled out the commitment and consistency effect and he felt safe to say, I am not going to buy your packages anymore. You cheated.
This one is especially um, useful with social proof. Often, your automatic pilot will kick in and see many people are doing this, therefore I should do it as well. In fact, uh, as Cialdini described in his book, many people that are interviewed in the street, random people, know extremely detailed uh, facts about products that are being sold. He described it himself, no, some other lady did, as customers from Mars. Uh, in the book he describes an example of a politician that is interviewing a random person on the street who can actually um, say about the entire political program of that party. They interviewed three persons and each and every one of them knew the entire program of the political party uh, that was this about. If other people are reading this, they should think, no, that's not good. Those people are not relevant others. They are not similar to me. These people have been instructed. Therefore, you should shut off your automatic pilot for a second and um, make sure that these people are not used as references in your mind. It's a very difficult thing to do because social proof is so deeply ingrained in our brain that we just want to believe what these other people are saying. If you step back, it in fact helps to physically step back from a situation you want to distance yourself from and try to look at it from a perspective. Am I being taken here? Is this bad social proof? Are people trying to game me? You can get a far stronger perspective on what's happening and try to shut off most of these psychological tactics and in fact take your advantage of them in a way you want them to. Covered a lot of ground. Are there any questions regarding what I have just been saying? Feel free to give feedback on Twitter, and I hope you have a great end of JMBL. <laughs>